This conference will now be recorded. Fantastic. Let's kick this off. So with me here today is Aaron Allsbrook, CTO and product visionary of Clearblade. Uh, so you can put some uh, pretty faces to the lovely voices that you'll be hearing. Um, what I find unique about our partnership with Clearblade is not just the fact that we have a hardware solution and a software solution that can operate together, um, but really breaking it down to the fact that a lot of the, the industry hurdles that we come across when implementing and deploying industrial IoT solutions are often solved through edge type applications and edge computing type solutions. So the focus of today's call is going to be very much on a lot of the challenges, a lot of the hurdles that we see when uh, implementing a lot of newer modern industrial IoT type solutions and how we can help overcome these. Uh, the general idea and what I want to close out with with everybody on the call is the notion that really developing solutions, industrial solutions for IoT offerings, uh, we want to take kind of some of the, the mystery out of it and the intimidation out of it and show you how we can break it down to a pretty simple and basic uh, network topology and diagram that can be replicated across a multitude of individual industrial industries and verticals alike. So before I get into that, just to touch a little bit on who is FreeWave, we might be a relatively new brand for some of you guys. FreeWave is a wireless hardware manufacturer based in Boulder, Colorado. We've been around for 26 years. We just hit our 26 year anniversary and we have a background really into an industrial and machine to machine wireless communications. Uh, more specifically, long range type communications, communications in scenarios where the devices may be in remote locations, environmentally hazardous locations, and uh, availability of power becomes a hurdle as well. So typically folks have seen us deployed in SCADA type scenarios. And for those of you who may be a little less familiar with SCADA, it's um, in short a, uh, a way of implementing IIoT before industrial IoT was really a concept or an industry standard. But where has that brought us to today, especially in this partnership with Clearblade? So as I mentioned before, Clearblade and Freewave, we, we both jointly see a lot of the solutions, a lot of the progress being made through edge applications. So as a hardware manufacturer, we took our core platform, we took really our core strength and integrated really a Linux environment within the hardware itself. So in addition to a connectivity device, an industrial connectivity device, we leveraged our strengths, we leveraged our expertise in industrial markets, and really are pushing the notion of edge computing through our product portfolio, which uh, is a lot of what we'll talk about today. But outside of us, I wanna set the stage with really a high level overview of industrial IoT, what's kind of gotten us here, and set the stage for Aaron as he's gonna go through a variety of industry challenges and use cases that we're gonna look at as well. But if you look at traditionally what happens in industrial environments, what folks are looking for and the processes that are occurring, uh, typically you'll have an operational technology group, division and manager or OT if you will. Now, what they're looking at is, is pretty simple and straightforward. If they have a variety of sensors or devices or controllers on their industrial machinery, what they're interested in is simple. What is the temperature? What is the pressure? What is the feed that is coming off of the system that I can act and make decisions based off of in a very unanimous and straightforward way? Now, the shift that we've seen really comes down to the high propensity of data that we've seen, say, over the past decade and what can be done with this data. So outside of just the operational folks looking at that core, uh, the core detail of temperature, pressure, whatever that sensor might be pushing off, we've seen a variety of other departments, of other organizations really look at what this, what this data coming off of these devices could mean for them. Could it have predictive analytics and maintenance implications? Could HR start looking at who's calibrated or has been working on these sensors? Could finance start looking into these details? 
And the answer to all of them is essentially yes. We're, we're seeing this today. We're seeing the drive and the demand for this. So the good news is that for all of us on this call, all of us either as manufacturers, vendors, integrators, solution providers, this presents us with an abundance of opportunity to go in with our customers as the industry experts uh, build out our area of expertise and be able to solve some critical problems and hurdles that our customers are coming across and um, deploy much more robust industrial type monitoring solutions. Now with that, with opportunity always comes challenges and I'm gonna highlight a few just very briefly and set the stage for Aaron here as he gets much more granular, but really the three core challenges that we see as a hardware manufacturer, number one being asset location. In industrial environments, it's not as simple as uh, you have a building, you have a variety of um, devices, sensors that you're pulling data off of. I mean, this could be as remote as um, we have deployments, say, uh, for uh, monitoring in the Antarctic or going through the Permian Basin in Midland, Texas, where the edge is truly the edge, literally miles away from the core network. And that poses significant communications barriers that we have to overcome. The second of which is security. As we all know with any network, data security is always critical. But what happens when you have, and this ties into the third one, uh, legacy devices that were never really intended to be connected to the network. What happens when you have these long range communication gaps where it really opens the door for much more threats to come in and address this? So that's something that Aaron's going to talk about in very great detail. And then the last one, and arguably what I see as the most important, is legacy integration. Now, again, in these industrial environments, this, these aren't necessarily greenfield type deployments. These aren't new deployments. You have some assets that are very, very long in the tooth that have been operating for sometimes even decades and are planned to be operating for decades to come. And with that, it poses uh, concerns and hurdles with integrating these into a modern network, being able to manage and monitor these devices and synchronize them all into one single platform a huge hurdle that we're seeing day in, day out. Now, the simplistic view before we get into the, again, Aaron section is, what do we propose as a solution to this? And most simply put, I think what a lot of people are starting to see, us included, is not necessarily one manufacturer, one provider coming out saying, I have the end all be all solution. No. What we're starting to see is multiple manufacturers, multiple providers coming together as an ecosystem. Everybody with their areas of expertise, especially in the industrial space, where they can come in as part of the solution, work together with the overall ecosystem to develop the complete solution. So for the purposes of this call, we're gonna be talking about the free wave hardware combined with the intelligent software and edge monitoring of ClearBlade to come together with what we propose as a pretty darn decent solution for a lot of the problems that are posed out there today. Now, what we find unique about that is if you look at uh, a variety of industrial verticals, say oil and gas, water, wastewater, utilities, these are just to name a few of the very many. What's unique about what we're proposing and a lot of the solutions that FreeWave and ClearBlade have come together is that Really, the solution, it's about 90% there. Uh, there are obviously subtle nuances with a variety of deployments and a variety of different verticals. But as you go, as we go through Aaron's case studies and examples, we're going to see that the combination of these devices with a few tweaks here and there really, again, take the intimidation out of what it means to develop an industrial IoT offering and to deploy these types of solutions. So with that said, I will kick this over to Aaron and we'll get into it. Oh, fantastic, Tony. Thank you very much and appreciate the introduction and, and thanks uh, everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, I wanted to take a little time and try to tie together some of these, these buzzwords that we keep hearing, right? We've heard about IoT and IoT platforms and cloud for a little while and now we're hearing about the word edge. 
Um, and we're seeing folks who, who build, you know, like, like uh, Freewave who have fantastic gateway and hardened devices with their radios out in the field coming from the SCADA world. Um, and I, I just wanted to kind of talk about how these things come together and, and specifically around the challenges we're able to solve uh, working together. Uh, the challenges we're able to solve thinking about the, the cloud from one end of our IoT solution all the way down to the gateway edge environment where we have a platform as well. So we'll talk through those and then we'll go through some, some use cases that really hammer the home home, what's happening there, and, and basically call back to these challenges that we're overcoming. So let's dive into the first one. The first one has to do with connectivity. Uh, and feel free to, to build these slides with me as we go here, Tony. But ultimately, if you think about what's happening, we have in the field, the left-hand side of this diagram, we have our gateway device running our edge platform, um, and it needs to communicate with lots of existing devices and new devices. Um, it is different than our, our home ecosystems. We all love our smart homes, um, but there are a lot of protocols that exist in our industrial world, in our business and enterprise world. If we're in rail, we've got to talk to uh, raw GPIO, we've got to pull off SNMP, we've got Modbus, we have acronym soup of different protocols that go across all sorts of industries. In buildings, it's BACnet. In, in um, uh, manufacturing, it's OPC UA. Right? It's a whole range. And then, of course, not to be outdone, we have a whole new range of uh, wireless protocols. So wireless protocols that can do some very cool things. We can position, we can talk, we can uh, we can interact without having to be plugged in. But that's BLE, that's Zigbee, that's Z-Wave. What a mess of different protocols that have to be normalized. With the edge, we are able to do that. We're able to take all of that data from all those different sources, bring it into a common standard, and begin interacting with it in real time. So we can let a, a you know a 20 year old device in the field that's been monitoring a railroad crossing talk to a brand new uh, Apple iPhone if that's what we need to do. We can basically create that interaction and the Edge platform solves that challenge for us. Keep building here for me, Tony. You also talk about we do need to do the the other side of that equation, that is that enterprise side. We need to be able to use that same platform, those same principles and interact with our enterprise as well and there we see a lot of legacy sorts of behaviors as well uh, whether it's running to uh, you know legacy uh, messaging protocols whether it's file transfers um, whether it's soap messages that were you know big in 2000 right so we have a whole ecosystem we have to work back and forth but we need our IOT software we need our hardware all those things need to work together to tie this ecosystem together Let's look at the next challenge The next challenge has to do with durability. Um, you know, we, we all get super frustrated at home. Uh, just to quickly check, can you guys hear me okay, Tony? Yeah, I just got a note that audio is an issue, but I, I hear it just fine. Um, so I'll address that. Hopefully it's uh, not across the board. Okay, I'll keep going. Feel free to interrupt me if you need to. Um, the next one is durability. So durability has to do that with the idea that um, at home it's you know it's frustrating when our Wi-Fi goes down and Netflix doesn't work. Um, but in an operational environment, it costs us millions of dollars if suddenly our factory processes aren't working. It costs us damage in in pumps at the well site. It costs us potentially liability and human lives in the mine or at the railroad crossing. Um, so, so durability means the ability to keep our IoT solution running 100% of the time, even when we don't have that internet backhaul connection. So your customers, our customers together need to be able to build very hardened solutions tolerant to what the internet may be doing and, and that underlying dependency on the network backbone. Um, so if you build, right, if we only have cloud, meaning we send all of our data, we ask our cloud side or our back office, you know, should I stop this vehicle or should I predict a failure or do I alert this worker to an issue? If the Internet goes down, then things don't work. Our IoT solution has a full outage. Um, it's frustrating at home. It's catastrophic in our industrial world. 
if we bring the edge into it and we bring the platform edge into it, we can guarantee to maintain that uptime. Now, it'll be a microcosm of our entire IoT solution. It won't have the whole view of all the possible devices around the world, but everything that keeps those workers safe, that keeps those machines running, will be able to communicate locally with each other, persist data with each other, enforce the security model, and even render visualizations if we've got that edge platform running there on that, that gateway Zoom link device communicating with the RF and the different protocols that are there. So the edge platform is fundamental to the durability that IIT demands. Next challenge, so security. So, so um, Tony, you did a great job kind of alluding to this and, and it wouldn't be a good IoT talk if someone didn't make us all afraid about security. So I'll talk about how Edge helps solve the security challenge. Um, Edge is fundamental into us taking those maturity steps that we're all worried about at night. Um, and, and if you think about it, what's happening here in the operational side on the left hand side of this diagram is we have a lot of devices and and let's hope maybe they're new but we but we can't guarantee that let's hope that they were thought without security out of the box but they probably didn't a lot of these devices probably come from that SCADA time period they come from a period where the they weren't going to get connected to the internet and they certainly didn't have an understanding of how to protect themselves their idea of protection was to be something called air gapped that means they just didn't plug in so now we have all these devices, they don't have the capability, they don't have the horsepower, and they certainly haven't been using cloud best security practices or encryption security practices. But with that edge, with that Zoom link, with that platform software sitting there, we actually can take those best practices and move them down to that operational field environment where we have authentication, every device authenticates. We have authorization. We make sure that the the refrigerator or the the, the uh, brownfield device can't run credit card transactions by having the right authorization around it. We bring encryption down. Encryption is something that continually gets better. It continually improves. We can bring that to all of those devices so that we can protect them so that they can use today's best algorithms and continually to enhance them over time. And of course, so much of this world needs the ability to do an audit trail and expire things over time. Our edge platform running there talking to those devices locally can be the secure protection front end, sending data back to our, our IT or into our clouds, but it can provide that security. Of course, if you think about the cloud side of that, we're not going to abandon our best practices. We're actually going to help move those down. We're still going to have a root of trust, right? We're not going to suddenly lose trust about it all, so we're going to be able to leverage that. We're still going to want a system of record. So we're still gonna pump that data to the right places. We want it to land in those systems where we optimize our businesses. We'll leverage the red user registries and device profiles. So there still will be a constant source of trust, even though we've been able to move some of the security functions all the way out to that operational environment. So that's security. And that's why the edge is so important if we're gonna solve this challenge the right way. Um, the next challenge has to do with performance. Um, we have all enjoyed the horizontal scalability of the cloud, the idea that there are just machines waiting out there for us to spin them up and leverage them and, and grow horizontal cloud scale. Um, but that cloud scale comes at a cost and a complexity. Um, we have certainly seen customers who've overrun uh, their, their cloud capability. They've used more than they can. There, there are limits out there. One of the best ways to help control that cloud uh, ever expansion is to leverage the fact that we've got um, a tremendous amount of compute um, and speed that we can do, right? And so if you think about what's going on, if we were gonna do a cloud transaction and needed it to run fast, in the best case scenario, a, a user might send a message and you'll see here that you know the one little millisecond up to our, our Zoom link edge it's processed there, and then that data has to get sent to a cloud to be understood. So we send that data up. It takes a, a, a quite performant network, uh, 300 milliseconds. It lands in our cloud du jour, where it then has some uh, dynamic logic, some microservice logic about it, where it might go and do some data access, followed by some big data analysis. So we're building up time here as all of this works, right? There's uh, a 1.7 seconds to pull out of the database. There's a, a 1.1 seconds to run our neural network across this. Now we've got a response. We ship it back to our gateway environment. There's more time here. The payload's a little bigger. It lands back on our gateway environment where we then say, oh, who do we need to tell this response to? 
we'll go ahead and tell our, our other device that it's time to uh, interact with our user, right? And so we tell a total story here of, I, I think this is a one, a 4.5 seconds, right? Four and a half seconds. Not so bad in our cloud world, in our internet world. Um, I certainly want my garage to take that long to open, but we can live with that. But that is not good enough for our industrial environments. These are places where people's lives are, are counting on these things to work. These are places where machines, if they don't cut off at the right time, they can damage themselves. Um, these environments become much more critical. So if you look at what you can do by having the subset of that functionality run on that platform, we gain a ton of performance. So in this case, you look at be my one millisecond for the device, it's processed there locally with its own data store and then sent to the other, other user. That could be a 22 millisecond uh, uh, data transfer. And, and that's a very, very realistic number in our own personal experience and our customers. So you get a tremendous amount of speed and performance by leveraging that external, that local operational gateway where that Zoom link is running with an edge platform. Next challenge, scalability. And then I was alluding to this last time, scalability has to do with how do we grow out our, our, our solution to handle not only 100 devices or 1,000 devices or 10,000 millions of devices, these numbers very rapidly grow and it's often tied to our success. We want these solutions to grow. So the edge, the, the uh, gateway platform is gonna give us the ability to support more devices by reducing how much data we have to send up to our cloud. That means when the data comes in, we can actually connect all those devices right there and have a single point where they come in their data is normalized, it's understood, and then potentially we actually groom it right there. We realize, you know what, this is just a good old log entry. It's not so valuable for our cloud backend to know. And so we can actually keep that information there. Um, and then we could even go even further and, and then you know do things like AI algorithms. So we can keep our logic in the field and only send back to the cloud what's important. If you go back to the cloud, now we still have that on-demand compute capability. We can blow it out as we need. Um, and we can leverage things like uh, the, the unlimited data stores, the big data stores they have there. But we get more control as how we use it and how we invest our companies and in, in, uh, in, in resources at that cloud option versus that edge gateway environment. Moving on to the next challenge. The next challenge is cost, and this one, uh, this is one that people very rapidly get. Um, you know, if you look at how the, the 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 world has changed since the traditional enterprise licensing server that people have been you know bought for many years, now we're looking at more of a cloud model where it's transactional. It's per amount of data you send up, per the amount of data you pull out. It depends on how many times you run an AI algorithm, and then how much data do you. Um, and in the beginning, those transactions look very efficient and small, but at scale, at industrial enterprise scale, these things become quite, quite heavy on our budgets, right? Um, so one of the things you can look at is because we have the ability to take what was function in the cloud, uh, big processing, big data storage, and then do that at the edge and reduce that information, we actually can reduce the amount that we send up to the cloud in the first place. We send higher quality, uh, better data, more enriched, more important data up to our cloud or to our on-prem servers rather than just everything. So we have groomed information. Uh, we have the ability to support many more devices down there so we don't have to pay per device. Um, and we can basically control our cost over time um, by having edge platform, IoT platform out there in the field running on that Zoom link device. The last piece is a challenge that, that both sides share, and that's deployment. Um, you know, I start with kind of the cloud-only sorts of behaviors. We certainly have learned over the years how to architect and develop uh, very large systems um, in the cloud. Uh, we do that um, with, you know, great DevOps practices. We've simplified our development for, for the developers out there. We've automated tests. Um, that's been a, a huge revolution in what we've done through containerization and such over the years. Um, if you think about what we're doing here is we are yet again extending our cloud or at least our view of the cloud down to these remote devices and letting them do the work in the field in a very performant manner. 
So we're going to take our DevOps cloud practices, cloud scale practices, and move them down to the edge, right? And so we're going to still be able to get the real-time in, uh, interaction like we do with the cloud when we provision compute. We're going to get the security models. We're going to be able to do the custom deployments. Um, but that's what we have to make sure we're doing as we move into this new realm. Otherwise, we end up much like we did with some of our back office IT and proliferation of uncontrolled devices. We need to bring those practices over um, as part of our edge uh, our gateway and edge compute solutions. I think with that, I'll kind of stop and transition out of some of the challenges we jump into and talk more about some use cases, some use cases that we've seen um, where it really does hit on some of these challenges, maybe scalability, uh, maybe hardening, maybe performance, um, the, the durability. So, so I'll go through a few of those um, to kind of help paint some pictures about what your customers might be challenged with or, or what they might be interested in trying to do. The first one is uh, tracking uh, mining vehicles. So, so the little vehicle there is, a, is a, what's called a slag hauler. Um, the slag haulers essentially take what is the the you know, the molten metal, the slag off the top, the, you know, the, the not the ore that's of interest. Um, they have these in gigantic pots. Uh, they then drive these across the mine uh, where they're put into the, into the dump area. Um, you can imagine that, that trying to interact with one of these slag haulers amidst its journey um, is not something that you want to be involved in. Uh, it's not something you want to be in the wave of, and you certainly don't want to have to cause it to slam on brakes and, and a volcano of lava goes everywhere, right? That's a, that's a mess. So, so what they've got here is a, is a real safety problem. Um, it's certainly a durability challenge. Um, it's certainly a performance challenge. They want to be able to protect the workers and the guests and the public, anyone who might be in that area of that slag hauler from the danger that slag hauler presents. So simply by putting uh, uh, the edge on the slag hauler, we can allow it to engage with the other gateway devices around to close and barrier off the public, the other machines from being able to get in the way of that slag hauler. Um, so that means that you have a high performance communication, you've got uh, connectivity with what is a lot of brownfield devices and existing vehicles. We're not some new fangled solution. Um, we have all sorts of constraints there, and of course, we want to make sure we protect that data um, to protect the end users. So again, it really resonates around the challenges our folks are feeling with, how do I build this IoT solution that really works in a, in a challenging, hardened environment? And, and this is certainly one of those. Uh, another example is uh, kind of similar in nature, but yet much more static, something we all bump into all the time, um, and that's railroad crossings. Uh, if you think about a railroad crossing, they're, they're everywhere across North America, they're everywhere around the world, quite frankly. Um, railroads are very, very committed to safety, not only for their employees, but, but the public around. Um, if you look at where does the public engage with the railroad, most often it's not on the rail yard, it's not on the wayside, it is you know, purely at these railroad crossings between intersections of cars and trains. This is where railroads can find ways to help make their, their environment safer for the public. And they are, right? They're investing heavily to understand the, the health of those crossings to make sure they're adequately alerting the public um, as fast as possible. And so in this case, if you think about this, this is a remote environment. It's talking to arms, it's talking to lamps, it's talking to bells, it's talking to devices that are not Greenfield brand new, right? They've been there for years and years. It's pulling off very primitive data in some cases about uh, whether or not the um, voltage and the right current ran through the motor that brought the arm up. It's understanding it in unique ways of understanding, okay, it's, it appears that it took uh, seven seconds for the arm to go up. Uh, is that adequate? It's tying it in the context of the bell should be ringing, uh, tying in the context that we just got the XR relay that says the train's arriving and when the train's left. Right? There's a holistic understanding of all these individual parts uh, and data sources that has to come together, um, has to come together right there locally in the remote industrial area of the actual crossing. And that's why the edge is so compelling. You can get that data, you can have it all right there, you can ensure every time the train goes by that you've got the proper behavior. You don't have to go and only know that it only worked when our last inspection occurred we get real-time data all the time. 
Of course, we're able then to get that data where they want it and integrate it with the systems that they need, which means get into your back office, talk to your ticketing system, get the right maintainer out there with the right part the first time to know, you know, the bells aren't ringing correctly and we got to go replace that or, or the batteries are low or, or we think the arm has been knocked off, right? We get all of that data for the first time um, and immediate, right? So really harpening on the actual challenges of the edge compute, that real-time device-to-device communication, uh, grooming the data before it comes back, not sending back the entire profile of the motor current pulling every millisecond, right? Just sending back the state of health of the crossing. Um, another ex ex existing, uh, ex uh, interesting example of, of why edge is important is around uh, refrigerated cargo monitoring, right? And this is a partnership we've got going with, with Ingram, is understanding basically the health of refrigerators. Um, you know, you think to yourself, well, that doesn't sound so interesting, but there's a, a lot of cost around refrigeration and spoilage. Uh, there's a lot of cost around not properly maintaining that. Um, and, you know, whether you catch it or not, the food has gone bad and that has a whole thing around the supply chain. Uh, so it's incredibly important that we keep that. And then, of course, as these things move around in cargo and such, we go in and out of connectivity. So building the proper amount of, yes, store and forward as it happens is done thanks to the fact that we've got uh, that edge computing processing, pulling in those temperatures, pulling in the door open and close sensors, um, despite the fact that we've got the, the you know, the, or in, thanks to the fact that we've gotten the durable environment even if it goes in and out of cellular range. Other thing here is a lot about how do we get the right profile of rules to alert the right folks when something's going wrong. You know, whether or not we haven't heard from the refrigerator in a certain amount of time, whether or not we know the door's been open for over a certain duration, we need to alert the right folks to get that problem resolved. We need to alert the right stakeholders, the owner, the shipper that this stuff is, is uh, at risk. So that's a real big important of what we can do by pushing the solution down to the edge right to that refrigerator. Uh, next solution uh, is around the idea that we'll take that a step further. Um, this is one that we've done where we've actually not only begin tracking the state of that container beyond just refrigeration, but the actual GPS location, uh, some of the uh, accelerometers to know how it was banged up along the way, um, along with other temperatures to see if it overheated, but we actually can put the blockchain technology right there on the edge as well. So we have the ability to leverage what is you know, essentially a, a trusted uh, data store together. Um, so the value here is, is now we put the blockchain for our one life cycle of transaction of moving goods around on the actual truck. We don't have to have a everything connected up to one particular cloud to build that trust over time. When they do collect, they will perform that mutual understanding the blockchain does. Um, but ultimately, we can be sure that as uh, events take place, as data goes into that chain, um, it's been secured and encrypted um, and trusted amongst all the stakeholders as, uh, in this case, it's, it's food batches of food moving around. Um, so pretty interesting use case of, again, not only taking and measuring in real time despite connectivity on the actual logistics and asset tracking, but now adding that mutual chain of trust with that third party technology that we're able to do uh, with blockchain. Uh, next example uh, is in, is in uh, mining and, and oil and gas. Uh, if you think about what happens at a, at a wellhead, uh, there are a lot of machines running, there's pumps, there's motors, uh, that have a health associated with them. Um, and so certainly pulling back that data in the field, understanding that the machine is fine before we send back an alert of the machine has something going wrong with it or having to send all the data back that says the motor is running, the motor is running. We can process that data right there locally at the wellhead and say, if everything's fine, we don't need to send any messages back to our back office or into the into the uh, uh, maintainers. Um, there's also a lot of other interesting things that go on. There's uh, sand that goes into some of this stuff. There's uh, uh, fluids that need to get pumped in. There's different tanks of information. All that is not only derived and important the, for the success of the, of the pump, um, but it's also important to predict the health of the actual machines themselves using those consumables. So monitoring the state of consumables, monitoring to how they're being used by the actual uh, equipment around all get, creates a more holistic view of the health of that particular well. 
um, and, and what's going on. Again, you got to process this. Well, you could process it all in the cloud, but you'd lose that durability. You'd pay for it. You'd have a hard time getting everything connected up, bringing it all with the edge. We're able to get a holistic understanding right then and there, um, and then communicate back to our back office the exact state of this well and, and the needs and, and, re and work requests associated with it. Uh, moving on. Another one that uh, comes up a lot for edge-based processing is locationing, especially indoor locationing. Um, indoor locationing can be very expensive uh, for compute. Um, doing indoor positioning in, in the cloud is, is nearly impossible. If you think about what's happening, you have many different uh, antennas, you've got tags moving around, um, and positions are calculated because of very, very fine movements and, and very fast paces. So, so a, a tag may blink and you literally have five milliseconds to process everything about that tag blinking off of nine to 10 antennas go inside a room to get a fine grained position. You've got to do that processing right there at the edge. Uh, you want to be able to get that uh, logic processed not only to find the position and, and paint the pretty picture you see here, but what's more important about positioning and indoor locationing is the ability to put it in the context of the business problem you have going on. Here it's demonstrating a chemical environment, right? So monitoring where chemicals go within the actual manufacturing facility in relationship to the other um, uh, workers that might be there, the technicians, the scientists, the, the main maintenance staff, right? You will need to be able to monitor these things and track where they go. You can't do this from, a, you know, a single back office. You have to do it right there in that location to process those things, apply and enrich those assets with the state that says this is a chemical, this is a scientist, and then go back and put the rules next to that. These two chemicals should never be in the same room together. This chemical and this size batch should never leave uh, this particular lab area. All of these rules having to do with location itself or proximity between two things needs to be done right then and there at that edge location. So really indoor positioning, indoor locationing, and the logic and alerting around that has to be done and really takes a lot of advantage of edge computing where, where your customer's just gonna want it. I believe I've got two more use cases, so I'll keep moving. Another one that, that makes obvious sense to everyone, especially when you think about durability, is vessels and, and maritime. Um, we all have thought about the fact that, that ships go out to sea and, and evidently containers just fall off of ships. That's, that's a problem especially if what's your computer or your new laptop's on that particular container. Um, but there's all sorts of other things that are going on at sea. So you need the ability to monitor not only each container individually and how it's maintained and how it's beat up as, it sh as the shipping, you know, the yaw and roll uh, of the boat itself. Um, but then you have things like the, what is the security processes on the boat? Um, you know, where, what's going on, you know, general environmentals for, for certainly humidity, uh, and temperature are important for on the boat itself. You've got a lot of equipment, physical equipment. It's it's nearly a factory on its own of, of large motors running uh, to move the boat across across the ocean. Um, and then you've got other things that, that, that need to be processed in context. There. You need the whole IoT solution, actually the entire IoT solution set out there on that vessel out to sea. You need it there because it's expensive to send the data back. Yes, uh, they're great satellite providers, but you don't want to send back your entire IoT data stream across all of those solutions through that protocol. You want to get it all the way down to the information that's most interesting uh, for your your, um, your 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 enterprise to be able to react to, for your understanding of your customers to be able to react to. If you need to get a secondary part shipped because something's gone wrong, you need to be able to alert them that that needs to happen. You don't necessarily want all the data of what's happened to the container over the last seven days at sea. Um, so maritime is certainly a very obvious place where edge computing is, is going to run wild and your customers are probably trying to solve problems there for all sorts of different challenges they may have, especially when they're out in remote places like the ocean. Uh, last one here I'll talk about as a use case has to do with just uh, more general, right? I, a lot of pretty pictures you've seen um, but a lot of things of what could we do at that edge um, with in, in a real simple manner to help us get a much better understanding of, of 
are things good in this remote loca location? And anomaly detection is, is one of the simple ones. Anomaly detection allows you to basically keep a previous data set. So you look at what's gone on for the last uh, 10 minutes, the last hour, the last two days, and you draw some boundaries around it, right? You draw some expectations and, and you set that, how strict are we going to be? And then you look to make sure that as time goes forward, you stay within those boundaries. Um, this is really cool because this means we don't necessarily have to right away uh, go have the experts tell us, well, you know, 52 degrees is a problem, but 51 is fine. What we can do is put some very simple boundaries in that then can be tolerant to the fact that, that the environment changes. If, if we're monitoring how bright a light bulb is, um, that brightness changes throughout the course of the day. The sun will throw out a lot of its own uh, electrons, its own lumens, right, so to speak. So even if we have our light bulb off, there will still be a certain level of brightness our sensors will be reading. At night, that changes. So having something tolerant that can follow that wave and that curve across the environmentals is a really compelling way to ensure that we very rapidly get things like anomalies brought forward. So we can very rapidly say, okay, these vibrations on this machine have changed. They shouldn't have changed this quickly. Uh, we can immediately go in and issue the appropriate warning to say uh, that, that something's out of balance. We've lost a particular bearing along the way. Um, so it's a great example of, you know what, you might not want the visualization, but you certainly want the alert when we've gone into the anomalous range of things. I think I'll kind of wind down there from different use cases and just talk about, you know, you know why is ClearBlade and why are FreeWave having such fun in this space? What are we doing that's, that's interesting? And I'll, I'll give you a little background about our technology here, um, and then I'll turn it back over. But ultimately, you know, everyone on this call or everyone has on this call has customers who are trying to solve the, I know we've got things out in the field, the bottom layer here, devices out in the field um, that we want to get information out of, right? We want different stakeholders to know things about it. Um, and those stakeholders are using systems and, and, and um, IT applications that have been bought in the last 20 years from, from the who's who of vendors across the top and many others, right? So we want to be able to get data from our best of breed uh, Allen Bradley machine or, or NXP sensor or, or GE piece of equipment all the way back into our Maximo or Oracle or SAP. So we have the ability and what ClearBlade is, is it's just a simple software in the middle that allows you to pull from any protocol to adapt it up, apply the security model associated with it. Um, and then so we can ensure that we have the appropriate amount of uh, authentication, authorization, encryption going on, and then let you flow that data as you want. You can send it and store it in databases. You can run your own business logic. You can even visualize it in the, some of those pretty portals that, that we were demonstrating earlier. And then, of course, we provide you the ability to ship it into the Maximos, the different systems, the Salesforce on the northbound side, uh, the Azures, the Power, Power BIs that you might want to use if, if you've already got those in-house. So we're just providing that path between the two sides. If you go forward one more, how does it apply with, with folks like Zoom, Zoom Link and Ingram Micro together, FreeWave and Ingram Micro together? Well, the ClearBlade platform, the, the picture here on top, that runs in the cloud or runs on-prem where you want it to go, but it allows you to put that whole platform on that Zoom Link device. That Edge platform now runs on that gateway and allows you to do all of those activities, everything that you want to might need to do as an IoT solution, you now have pushed into the field. You're talking to all those devices and whatever protocols they might be. You're bringing it all in. You're normalizing it. You're engaging with the workers there locally. Uh, and then we handle, you know, is it time to send information back? Yes, we will send that data information back. We'll give you real simple check boxes for how you say keep these things in sync. And if you change rules, you want to push a new AI algorithm, we'll do that for you seamlessly. We'll get it out into the field for you. Tony, with that, I'll stop. And, and hopefully that helps kind of position us in this software world and how we can work together with, with your hardware. All right, Aaron, thank you. Thank you very much. So in closing, what I really want to highlight here, I think if we uh, haven't collectively said it enough, both uh, FreeWave and ClearBlade, we very much see the solution for a lot of these hurdles really laying in the edge. Uh, both organizations have adopted that as our um, 
real modern philosophy and it's something that we're going to continue pushing forward and, and finding success in. So our intention here is to share that expertise, uh, 26 years on Free Waves End and uh, over a decade on Clearblade, I believe, um, and really see how we can't leverage the partner ecosystem to really start deploying these types of solutions and bringing a lot of these industrial applications into the future. So before I get into questions, I do want to highlight for those of you on this call, since we are doing this webinar in partnership with Ingram Micro's IoT group and division, we'd like to, well, we not like to, we have put together a basically smart monitoring demo bundle. Now what this includes is two FreeWave gateways with the IQ platform and it'll also include uh, within that platform our 900 megahertz frequency hopping spread spectrum communication, again, for designed for real uh, long distance and remote communications. It also includes two Clearblade Edge licenses with a six month platform trial. Now, the intention here again is to really kind of help folks get their hands on this, really understand how seamless this is, whether it's something that you'd intend to deploy in a tank monitoring application or maybe a rail monitoring application or a multitude of applications that Aaron highlighted earlier. So if this is of interest, certainly contact the Ingram Micro IoT team. You can see the details there below and we'll have a follow up with it with the reference SKU 6YX795. Uh, the Ingram Micro IoT group is very well versed in both FreeWave and ClearBlade and can certainly help you walk you through it. But with that said, feel free to reach out to FreeWave and ClearBlade as well. Again, we're here to help you guys pull together these solutions, really help the customers start adopting and understanding how easily they can deploy more modern solutions. Take some of that uh, intimidation factor out of it and help bring folks into the future. So with that said, it looks like we got about 10 minutes for questions. So again, if you haven't submitted any questions, I saw a few come through. Uh, use the comment in the chat box uh, and address them to me and we'll certainly get them addressed. But uh, first one that popped up, is your solution an open, is your solution an open solution or does it lock your company into your technology? Um, I think both both groups can answer that, but Aaron, if we start with you, and then I'll cover the free wave side. Yeah, you know, one of the good question, one of the core tenets we've had over the years is 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 no one company is going to be able to solve IoT, um, and and in order for us all to work together, we have to start with uh, open technologies for how we collaborate. Uh, so if you look at what we've done at Clearblade. Uh, we've started with open protocols. Everything we do runs over open standard protocols like MQTT or REST. Uh, we make everything exportable. So if you decide you want to pull out your solution, it comes out as human readable code. It comes out as human readable data structures. You can send the data wherever you want. Uh, and then we run on open architectures. So we run across a whole gamut of processor types, uh, clouds, so really uh, what I hope is, is we are providing the, the tools to rapidly engage with all the open protocols to pull everything together with ClearBlade. So openness is very, very important to us. Gotcha, gotcha. And then tying that into the hardware end of things. So if you look at, um, if you look at edge computers, uh, edge gateways, whatever vernacular you like to use, um, these things really are designed to be deployed on any wired or wireless type networks, whether that's something that's a little bit older, longer in the tooth or some of the more emerging standards. And when you take the, the FreeWave RF component into it, well, the 900 megahertz portion is proprietary. That certainly leaves a lot of room open to connect, say, to an LTE network or to a LoRa network communicating directly with LoRa sensors and LoRa gateways. Um, so no, we very much see that the proprietary nature of a lot of these devices, the, the industrial industry is starting to move away from that. In the enterprise, we've been seeing standards-based solutions for, for years. Um, that's something that really, really is being driven now in the industrial community as well. And we're seeing a lot of progress being made there. So let's see, next question here. How quickly can you get something deployed? So well, again, let's start with Aaron and uh, I can cover the three wave portion of that. 
Yeah, so I mean, of course, uh, an IoT deployment has both an operational side and an IET side. Um, and so when you look at this IT side, one of the reasons why we partnered with, with FreeWave here for this smart monitoring is to really let you get something real and up in, in a matter of weeks, right? So the smart monitoring solution out of the box is gonna give you the ability to rapidly begin to see this data roll in, rapidly visualize it the way you wanna see it and begin to build uh, the rules and stuff around it in a, in a number of, a, a couple of weeks, right? So that's that's the intent behind this, of course, IoT solutions that are our customers and your customers want to build do have to get market differentiating for themselves. They want the ability to be able to uh, customize it in a way that helps them achieve, you know, a differentiating market value for, for their business. And so that's where you have the ability to take this, this initial smart monitoring out of the box and accelerate it into a solution very specific for your business, whether it's rail or mining or oil and gas or, or shipping but to very quickly take that and then tune it to the particular use cases, configure the rules you want for your type of environment. Um, and, and that can be done kind of going forward after those initial kind of two weeks of success. Thank you, Aaron. And um, just touching on the FreeWave side of things, well, well, first the FreeWave and ClearBlade side of things, in terms of just initial load and getting the two products together, hardware and software, that is a very seamless process. That's probably the most, uh, seamless process within the whole solution. Now with hardware, where that's concerned, obviously in, in more environmental, uh, environmentally challenging environments, it does pose some problems. Not to say that the couple weeks that Aaron mentioned is unrealistic, um, but we have a team of both pre and post sales engineers who can certainly walk anybody through whether it's something as simple as a path study looking at uh, GPS coordinates to see how things might be set up on the radio and RF side of things. Um, if it's simply edge computing, that certainly makes the process much more seamless as well. All right, can your radios be used to transmit real-time video from the ethernet port? Um, bit of a loaded question. I will give you a somewhat of a uh, soft yes. <laughs> um, now, with with RF, particularly ours, there, there's always the balance of you can either go really far or you can go really fast. Now, with ours designed for the former to, to go really far, uh, throughput and bandwidth is nowhere near what you would see, say, in a Wi-Fi type environment where you can send live video streams through um, an enterprise access point, if you will. Our, our throughput is much slower, again, with that design to travel longer distances. Now, with that said, we do have deployments where video is passed through. It's not very high frame rate. It's not, um, you know, like live streaming crystal clear. Um, but it depends on the use case and how, how clear you do need to see that video. And in addition to that, um, we have partnered with a handful of video compression uh, partners who can basically, similar to how we work with ClearBlade, have their software loaded on our edge compute devices that will perform that video compression that will allow more of a, a live and seamless stream over a 900 megahertz uh, connection. So if there's any interest further on that, absolutely feel free to reach out to me. We can have a much more granular, detailed conversation around that. But thank you for the question. Um, next one. Are, is this uh, solution available internationally? If so, which countries? Uh, I think that will warrant a different answer from both ClearBlade and FreeWave. So again, Aaron, I'll let you start with that one. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, so certainly there's, there's export controls around where we can send things, but we've got customers today working with our software in Europe and Asia, um, and, and we are actively supporting those environments um, throughout the world. Um, and, and would be happy to talk to you about where, where uh, you know, if you've got a particular environment where you, you want an industrial solution, most likely we can, we can work together to figure out the right way to, to get it deployed. Great. And, and on the FreeWave side, the, the hardware side, again, export controls and regulations, again, are, uh, um, they pose some challenges. But the simple answer is yes. We, we are a global manufacturer. We do provide um, services in a multitude of different countries. Now, with the RF component of it, again, in-country certification and making sure that the bands in, on which we operate 
are allowed to be operated within that existing country, that's always something we need to take into account. So if there ever is an opportunity or if you're looking to build a solution for non-domestic markets, non-U.S. markets, certainly reach out to us. We have an international team who can identify whether or not we are approved within any given country. If the answer to that is no, we can have a conversation on really is there an opportunity? What is the process to get approved in that individual country? So um, very flexible on that end as well. But with that, that looks like we're wrapping up right here on the hour. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please reach out to Freeway, reach out to Clearblade, the Ingram Micro IoT team. Uh, we, we certainly want to help you guys as you're looking to build out the next generation of solutions and offerings for your business and uh, ultimately help out your customers, bringing them into a modern industrial IoT type scenario. So thank you everybody for taking the time to join. You'll see a follow up with the recorded webinar and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Tuesday. Hmm. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Really enjoyed. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Nice job, guys.